This Mr. Big character, does he have a real name? This video is brought to you by Skillshare. Why Mr. Big? I was out with a man whose name I wanted to shout from the rooftops. Out of the many Manhattan men Carrie Bradshaw samples and reviews, this guy wouldn't necessarily be the most obvious target for the obsessions of a sensitive, intellectual woman. Come on, everybody wonders what happens after you die. I'm too busy wondering who's dinging my car in the garage. Sex in the City's choice of central love object, Mr. Big, says something about the show and its times. After all, this is what we're first told about him in the pilot. You see that guy? He's the next Donald Trump, except he's younger and much better looking. The appeal of Mr. Big, apparently, has a lot to do with how rich and successful he is. He's a big man about town. And maybe this isn't a surprise in a show that so sexualizes expensive footwear. Sex in the City linked female empowerment with conspicuous consumption, and Mr. Big was the big prize, the symbol of making it in the Big Apple. So here's our take on the deeper cultural symbolism of Carrie's inability to quit big, and who the man actually was in Inside. I couldn't help but wonder, was it Mr. Big, was it New York, or was it me? If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell to get notified about all of our new videos. So who is this Trump-like crossword puzzle, this big New York man? And why did Sex in the City choose him? He is such a great guy. I mean, I don't know anybody any cooler than Mr. Big. Mr. Big is first and foremost an unattainable enigma. We don't learn his name until the last episode, and we never find out what his job is. So like Carrie, we're encouraged to buy into this aura of mystery. Are you afraid that the sheer force of it all will just pull you back into all that big stuff again? No, he's not Niagara Falls. Isn't he? If you step back, the finance guy who doesn't share any of her major interests is not an intuitive choice of mate for Carrie. I started reading your column after we met. You did? Yeah. Cute. Cute. Well, yeah, cute. As a fashion-loving writer, you might think she'd be impressed by someone with more cultural capital than capital capital. The big character might remind us of Scarlett O'Hara's romantic fixation in Gone with the Wind, Ashley Wilkes. Ashley, tell me you love me. I'll live on it the rest of my life. At the onset of the Civil War, to this Southern Belle, Ashley is the symbol of a genteel Old South that she feels has been lost, or gone with the wind. Scarlett finally realizes her love for Ashley was an illusion, the pursuit of something intangible that can't be possessed. I've loved something that, that doesn't really exist. While for Carrie, the spell of Mr. Big and what he represents is never fully broken. You know, he walks around his perfect apartment with his perfect suits, and he's just perfect, 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 and I'm the girl who farts. It was Mr. Big, major tycoon, major dreamboat and majorly out of my league. What exactly does Big represent to Carrie then? The most convincing explanation for why she sees him as so perfect is that he's exceptionally rich. You wanna go to the Caribbean next week? Sure, I'll go pack my jet ski. No, I'm serious. We could both use a vacation. He can agree to buy her the perfect penthouse or write a check to erase her money troubles, like it's nothing. He just gave you $30,000? And the little touches she finds charming are the behaviors of a rich man. I can't believe you actually got out of the car and got balloons. I didn't. Raoul did. Good man. Big was inspired by one of the real-life paramours of Candace Bushnell, who created the character of Carrie as a stand-in for herself in her columns. Big is thought to be based on Ron Galati, a former publisher of GQ known for a high-flying lifestyle and affairs with a number of beautiful women. Bushnell said the Big name was born because, quote, he was one of those New York guys with a big personality. You just notice him as soon as he walks in the room. I called him Mr. Big because he was like, a big man on campus. 
Carrie's idolization of Big, combined with her lust for expensive shoes, signals that this show is kind of an ode to materialism. Her idealistic-sounding search for true love is tied to a deep desire for wealth and luxury. Thus, when it comes down to it, Mr. Big is a materialist fantasy. He embodies whatever it is Carrie is trying to feel via all the shoe shopping. I spent $40,000 on shoes? And he enables the consumer in her. I got it. While canceling out her terrible financial state before him. I'm worth nothing. Money is a huge part of what Manhattan is. It's a city that revolves around wealth and status. And Carrie's love for Big is so tied to New York City that you could say he's an expression of the spirit of New York as she sees it. You can't leave New York. You're the Chrysler building. He was like the city itself. Cold, infuriating, and exhausting. I'm in a New York state of mind. Carrie and Mr. Big run into each other constantly. Why is it, in a city of 10 million men, you always see the one you don't want and never see the one you... Hi. And this is a New York fantasy. That hope that, in a city of so many millions, you'll just happen to bump into the one you're thinking about. The big she loves is the New York she loves. Fancy, suave, and expensive. I kissed Aiden goodbye, kicked the mud off my boots, and had a New York steak with my New York ex. Carrie describes Big as a crossword puzzle. Men in their 40s are like the New York Times Sunday crossword puzzle. Tricky, complicated, and you're never really sure you got the right answer. And for years we watched as she attempted to decode the mystery of Mr. Big. Is he a jerk? Is he just not that into her? Or is he really the love of her life who needs time to overcome emotional damage? Let's take some time to look at Sex in the City from the perspective of Mr. Big. What's striking when you rewatch the first season is that while Carrie is quick to paint Big's reluctance to commit as a moral failing, the simple truth seems to be that he's just not immediately sure about her. I had gone so far out on a limb with my feelings that I didn't realize I was standing out there alone. When she shows up drunk at his apartment to confront him for being embarrassed of her, Like I'm only a particular fragment of the kind of person you think that you should be dating. We can sort of see Carrie through his eyes when he says, But I've only gotten to know a particular fragment, although I'm beginning to know more. She quickly justifies her unhinged seeming behavior. No, this is not me. This is me reacting to your perception of me. Meanwhile, she's the first to admit that she hasn't even really been acting like herself with him, which means she hasn't given him the chance to fully know the real her. I mean, you should see me around him. I'm, I'm not like me. I'm like together, Carrie. So early on, it's not hard to see why Big has his doubts about Carrie. She leaps to overreacting over small things when they've only just started dating. Jesus, Carrie, come on. Would you knock at the off? I'm trying to watch this fight. Just fine, I'll leave. When she makes a huge deal about farting in front of him. Well, I think it's over. I should never have farted. And then frets because they don't have sex for a few nights. You farted, you're human. I don't want him to know that. She reveals an extreme level of insecurity festering underneath her cool exterior. Jesus, Carrie, that's it. I've heard enough about the fart. It's not the fart. She has a tendency to escalate suddenly to a scary level of rage. What was that all about the other night? That was me. Having a meltdown. She's quick to publicly embarrass him. Well, let's see. There's me, um, Julia. Oh, and let's not forget International Melissa. Carrie, I'm not doing this. At one party he brings her to, she lights up a cigarette inside the woman's apartment is pissed when she's told not to smoke inside. Well, don't be a bitch. I'm not being a bitch, I'm just being myself. You're being a little bit of a bitch. And then ends up kissing and going home with Jeremiah, the performance artist. We can only imagine how livid she'd be if Big did the same thing. I figured everything before I love you just doesn't count. When Carrie meets Big, he's a 40-something divorcee living a luxurious Manhattan life, who's set in his ways and not looking for any upset to his lifestyle. There is a very good reason that Big is gun-shy. He's scarred by a failed marriage. Well, why did you get married? I was a fool in love. Oh, that is so sweet. 
and then I was a fool in divorce court. These two are coming from very different places. Carrie has made it to her 30s without ever truly being in love. I get it. You've never been in love. And this pure romantic is waiting for a perfect, all-consuming passion. I am someone who is looking for love. Can't live without each other love. Mr. Big has felt that kind of love and seen it fall apart. Have you ever been in love? Absolutely. Carrie seems charmed and intrigued by this statement, but she doesn't understand that his romantic past might have an effect on him. My mother doesn't need to meet another girlfriend. Oh. I didn't mean that. But post Big, after she's been damaged by heartbreak herself... My freak. The frightening woman whose fear ate her sanity. She acts the same way with Aiden, needing to take things slow and being reluctant to commit. The irony is Aiden's acting exactly the way I wish Big would have behaved, and I'm behaving just like Big. What Big keeps telling Carrie is that he needs time to know. I'll introduce you as my girlfriend when I'm sure. Oh. Look, I have to do things on my time frame. But it's just something I've got to do in my own time. And Carrie refuses to give him that. My friend, Carrie. Oh, you show up at church after I asked you not to. What are you trying to do, test me? Just tell me I'm the one. Carrie also establishes a pattern from the very start of telling Big one thing and meaning or expecting another. She first describes herself as, I'm sort of a sexual anthropologist. Carrie's way of introducing herself makes it sound like she's some kind of wild, erotic adventurer. You mean like a hooker? Not someone who's looking to be quickly tied down into a committed relationship. From there, Carrie continues a pattern of projecting something false and then reacting violently when she doesn't get what she secretly wants. I can't believe it. He's seen other women. Rick. True, we had never discussed exclusivity. Before Big tells Carrie about his engagement to Natasha, Carrie puts on a casual front, saying she's just interested in friendship. Friends talk about their relationships, so uh, go ahead, friend. Tell me about the girl. Then she tries to force him into a dismissive narrative about his new relationship. Maybe we should make a pact. We don't talk about our relationships until they get really serious or something. When he responds by being truthful with her, We're engaged. I wanted you to hear it from me. She again resorts to publicly shaming him. Don't help me. Don't you help me. And making a scene that casts herself as the victim. Of course she's going to be upset, but we can imagine this tendency to have a hidden agenda and then suddenly escalate to an aggressive outburst is one reason Big shuts off. He certainly is a poor communicator, but so is she. What do you want from me? What do I want from you? Nothing. I don't want anything from you. Another pattern we see in their communication is that Carrie pushes him for a verbal commitment or a step forward in their relationship, and Big doesn't grant it. Yet Carrie nonetheless interprets his nonverbal behavior as an affirmative answer. When she asks him if he wants to be monogamous, Don't you want to stand still with me? He sort of smiles and puts his arm around her, and she takes that as a yes. When Carrie tells him that she does want to get married someday, he again doesn't really answer directly. I mean, it's all in the timing. You gotta brown the garlic before you put in the onions. I thought we were having fun. When he does respond verbally, he's usually non-committal, offering her a joke. I'm afraid we don't want the same things. Things like cake? Or something along the lines of a maybe. Then maybe this is for real? Could be. Before distracting her with a kiss, in all these moments, he doesn't say what Carrie wants him to, even when that would be easier. Carrie, Carrie. Harry. Mr. Big actor Chris Noth said, quote, He never tried to pretend he was anything other than what he was. It was Carrie who tried to pretend he was something he wasn't. Which is why I'm never getting married again. Throughout the series, Carrie misinterprets Big's behavior and generally sees what she expects to see. I didn't read the signs. You were unavailable and very clear about that. This sexual analyst has a lot of generalizations ready about men. Men are 
bullshit. The very first episode is about her quest to have sex like a man, which in her view means being selfish and unattached to the person you're sleeping with. Right now I'm researching an article about women who have sex like men. You know, they have sex, and then afterwards they feel nothing. Every time Mr. Big does something that isn't what she wants, she's ready to pounce on him accusingly, saying essentially that she knew he was going to disappoint her. I knew you would do this! I knew it! Because he's a man. The epitome of men. It isn't about us. This is about work. No, this isn't about work. This is about us getting closer and you getting so freaked out that you have to put an ocean between us. Sarah Jessica Parker's seductive performance of Carrie does a lot to obscure how subjective her interpretation of events really is. I think it's very clear from this book that when it comes to me, you do not have good judgment. What the f is Carrie's problem? Well, I, actually, he had some, you know, commitment issues. That's bullshit, Gary! You know it! If you read some of the original columns by Candace Bushnell, the character's self-destructive side comes through more clearly in the cold, hard prose. In light of all this, the fact that Big continues to want to be with Carrie and keeps returning to her despite the drama shows that he feels something very strong for her. I'm talking about us. Life's too short. In the episode Secret Sex, Carrie dissects why her friend Mike won't publicly acknowledge Libby, a woman he adores in private. She was one of the only women he'd ever met who he felt he could just be with. So what's the problem? Line three. Right, look, she's not beautiful, and we don't have a lot in common. And she realizes that she's that embarrassing girl for Big. You won't introduce me to your friends. You bring me back to that restaurant where men take women they don't want to be seen with. At the end of the episode, Big dismisses her concerns. I think Feng Wa's is the best Chinese food in the city, so that's why we went there. The uh, guy we met in the street, I couldn't remember his name. But it does seem like Carrie was on to something. The way Mike talks about Libby sounds just like what Big might be thinking about Carrie. But she's warm and unpretentious and... It was the best sex I've ever had in my life. What are you afraid of? What other people are going to think? Look, all I know is that she's not the right woman for me in the larger sense. The most plausible reading of what's happening in the first two seasons is that Big is falling for Carrie, but a lot more slowly than she falls for him, in part because she's not his ideal woman. He has a certain image in his head of the kind of partner he should have on his arm. And probably others just have a thing for exceptionally beautiful women. Exactly. And there's something wrong with that. And that's why he goes on to marry Natasha. You know, she's shiny hair, style section, Vera Wang, and I'm, you know, the sex column they run next to ads for penile implants. This woman looks the part, but can't make him happy. Everything in my apartment is now beige. Beige is bullshit. I thought you wanted beige. And it seems that Big rushed into things with Natasha partly because he didn't want to face the messier, deeper intimacy that Carrie demanded of him. Why wasn't it me? It just got so hard. And she's... Yeah. Later on, Big's brief affair with a celebrity shows us that part of him can't resist chasing the most beautiful woman in the room and thus affirming his status. She's an actress. Willow Summers. She's not an actress, she's a movie star. This superficiality repeatedly leaves him burned. She could reach me, but I could never get her. Before and after his infatuations with these model-esque trophy women, Big keeps coming back to Carrie, gradually admitting to himself that she's the one who makes him happy. After a while, you just want to be with the one who makes you laugh. Know what I mean? Bushnell didn't end up with her big, and she's said that in real life, Carrie wouldn't end up with big either. But the TV show and the movie franchise felt a Hollywood ending was needed. I don't see why they couldn't make it work. This ending was not without controversy. I just always thought that you two would end up together. They were never supposed to be together. 
If she was gonna wind up with anybody, it was Aiden. Show creator Darren Starr has said that, quote, the show ultimately betrayed what it was about, which was that women don't ultimately find happiness from marriage. Not that they can't, but the show initially was going off script from the romantic comedies that had come before it. At the end, it became a conventional romantic comedy. Kiss me. The show itself vacillates back and forth on the question of whether Big is Carrie's soulmate or her addiction. Did I ever really love Big, or was I addicted to the pain, the exquisite pain of wanting someone so unattainable? He's almost an archetypal rendition of that unavailable bad boy you couldn't have, except that, in the end, Carrie does get to have him. Carrie, you're the one. As easy as it is to criticize Carrie for not shutting the door on Big, one true thing that comes through is that these two have a real chemistry and a natural rapport. Who do you think it is? Princess Grace of Monaco. She's dead. So you can understand my surprise. They're cute together. Wow, shouldn't this be in a museum? Be nice. And when he has heart surgery and she cares for him, it's easy for them to imagine growing old together. So I guess this is what we'd be like in our 70s, huh? Mm. No sex and board games? Seriously, kid. You and me? The early bird special? They just both have a lot of emotional complications to work out before they can get to that end destination. You said you loved me. I do. And why does it hurt so much? There's a line in the novel Lake Success, quote, Manhattan was not just for the winners, but the winners of winners. And there is a degree to which getting big for Carrie is about winning. In the finale, when he perfectly gives himself over to her, the look in her eyes is, on some level, victory. It took me a really long time to get here. I'm here. It's saying, finally, I won. She's convinced this man who's a cynic about love to perform the fairy tale romance. She's winning the big man to prove that she too is a winner of winners, a truly elite Manhattanite. I miss New York. Take me home. This video is sponsored by Skillshare an online learning community we love. With over 25,000 classes taught by seasoned pros, Skillshare has a class on pretty much anything you could want. You can develop your creativity through a class on calligraphy, graphic design, or writing. You can learn to succeed in business with classes on how to make it as a freelancer, market a podcast, or become an Instagram influencer. You can use it to master new technology through classes on web design, coding, and data science, or you can bring that extra flair into your lifestyle, sharpen your knife skills, learn paper making, speak Spanish, or let Marta Marie Forsberg, a food and lifestyle photographer, teach you everything you ever wanted to know about visual storytelling. Right now, Skillshare is offering our viewers two months access to all their classes for free. So click the link in the description below to sign up now.